Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 274. For this one, we're playing a massive high stakes cash game. There's tons of big bluffs, huge all-ins, and a ton of interesting situations. You guys are gonna love it. But before we get started, I have one quick announcement to make. It is the best time to sign up to WPT Global using the bonus code BRAD. Not only will you receive the deposit match bonus up to $1,200, but you'll also receive the satellite tickets to the WPT World Championship. And if you sign up during the month of November, if you deposit $100 or more, you'll receive an additional $50. So there's a ton of value to be had by signing up using that bonus code. I have more information in the description box below. Also, we have a couple of meetup games coming up. I have more information in the description box for those as well. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. It's Halloween weekend at the Lodge. We're in the lineup to play the 510 match a stack game that can get scary big with regular double and triple straddles. The lineup is pretty tough with a handful of high stakes pros all showing up in costume, including Upswing's poker instructor, Gary Blackwood, who's dressed as Phil Helmuth. Initially, everyone buys in for the max, which is 2000 to start, but we'll all be looking to add on soon. We have an opportunity to get involved right away. With the straddle on to 25, I raise the 75 from the cutoff with pocket queens. The crow is in the big blind, he makes the call. The under the gun straddler has a hand that he thinks could be best, he three bets a 280. Getting this all in pre-flop seems appealing, we won't want to see an overcard come out, but I go with a smaller sizing as I four bet to 600. The crow folds quickly, the biggest elf I've ever seen, declines his option to five bet jam, so I figure we have him beat, he calls for 320 more to play a heads up pot. The flop comes jack 7 5 with two clubs. We've got an over pair and a backdoor flush draw. The opponent checks. The most likely hands that I put him on are jacks, tens, and ace king. Jacks has us beat. Ace king and pocket tens won't want to call large bets. I go with a bet of 400. I'll jam on most turns. One third pot is an effective sizing. Ace king with no club will have a tough time playing future streets from out of position. The opponent folds. Right away, we win a pot to be up several hundred and have the largest stack at the table. Almost an orbit later, we've got Ace-5 suited on the button with a double straddle to 50 on. We raise to 160. Luigi's in the small blind with a hand that has us dominated. He three bets to 650, committing just over a quarter of his stack. In these button versus small blind situations, our opponent is going to have a lot of hands he's okay three betting, but won't love calling off his stack for. There's a new sheriff in town, and he four bet rips it. There's no immediate decision from the opponent. The young plumber looks a little backed up. He was hoping to win a pre-flop, now has a hand that he can only bluff catch with. It's not worth the risk. He folds. We get our bluff through to be up over a thousand, less than 10 hands into the session. The 50 is on again when we pick up the speed limit in the hijack. With six players still holding cards behind us, I go with a smaller raise to 125. Our nemesis, Wonder Elf, needs revenge. He three bets to 350. When on stream, I'm always looking for opportunities to get involved in the action. Effective stack sizes aren't all that deep, so I could make an argument for folding, but the idea of stacking someone usually only seen in Lord of the Rings movies and DMT trips seems fun. I call for 225 more to set mine. We're heads up in position. The flop comes 10-10-8 rainbow. The opponent may be concerned that we've got trips. He checks. The big blind could have ace king again. I put out a small bet of 200 to cheaply take control of the pot and charge worse hands. The opponent won't relinquish his hand for that amount. He calls. It doesn't necessarily mean that he'll have us beat since he'd still have called with plenty of combos containing two overs and backdoor draws. The turn is a third 10, alleviating some of the elf spears that we flop trips. It's now a lot more likely that an over pair could be good. The big blind checks. I don't want to bet and get check raised, especially by a bluff. The goal is to get to showdown. I check back, still thinking there's a good chance that we could be up against two overs. The river is the deuce of spades, it's a total blank. The opponent bets 700. If we were ahead on the flop and turn, we'll still be ahead. I call quickly, only to see that the elf beats us for more money than we won from him earlier. This is the happiest our opponent has been since he found out that there'd be a biographical movie about him starring Will Ferrell. We go from having a profitable session to being stuck a little. While an interview is being conducted, a big hand is developing that you'll see in the bottom left part of the screen. The triple straddle to 100 is on, Gazzy Phil raises the 250 from the button. Try not to be distracted by Robin's package. We 3 bet to 1100 from the small blind with pocket nines. You may notice that there are some red circles next to everyone's name. That's because we just started a round of the Nick game, which is going to create a lot more action than normal. I've also got a couple thousand more in my stack, 
after adding on 3,000 earlier. As alluded to previously, button versus small blind situations are going to induce lots of lighter 3 and 4 betting. Holy 4 bet, Gazzy fill jams for essentially just over 36 times the triple straddle amount. I snap call, we see that it's basically a flip, but an ace and a queen have already been folded pre-flop, so we're in decent shape. We're only running it one time for a $7,500 pot. The flop comes ace eight deuce rainbow. It's looking bleak as our chance of winning is reduced to 9%. The turn is the jack of hearts, it's no help. We need to hit one of two remaining nines or we'll have to add on once again. The river is the seven of spades wrapping up the victory for Gazzy Phil. He gets me good. While it's frustrating to lose, I'm not gonna burn the place to the ground or anything. I got it in as a slight favorite and unfortunately didn't get an ideal run out. I add on for 4,000 more, I'm in for 9,000 total. Currently, I'm in the hole for 4,000, but that's not an insurmountable number. I'm not panicking just yet, even though it feels like Sid just took out the magnifying glass. The nick game is still going and the double straddle to 50 is on as T1000 raises to 150 from the button. Again, players can open wide ranges from late position, which will induce lots of three bets from the small blind. Gazzy re-raises to 600. Our pocket pair could be the best hand, and even though no option is all that appealing, I want to get rid of this nit button. I cold 4-bet rip it for 4,000 to punish the opponents for being overly aggressive when I've got money in the pot. This is an extremely ambitious play that I wouldn't recommend unless you have reason to believe that the initial preflop raiser and the 3-better are both going to show up with a number of hands that they won't want to play for stacks. The button folds. It's not worth it for the small blind to call off for a couple thousand more. He folds as well. We have to turn over our cards in order to get rid of our nit button, which is in the form of a skull today. Next we've got King Jack offsuit on the button with a double straddle on. I raised to 125. The small blind has a hand that should normally be a 3-bet, but we already 4-bet jammed on him earlier in a button versus small blind situation, causing him to have to fold the best hand. We also 4-bet jammed pocket 7s that we just showed, so 3-betting me probably isn't too appealing. The small blind just calls. The elf defends his double straddle as we go three ways to the flop in position. It comes 10-7 deuce with two spades. We only have two overs and some backdoor draws. Checks to us. Let's try to take this one down without risking much. I bet 125. It's a quarter of the pot. If we get called, we can fire on plenty of turns if we pick up equity. Top pair isn't folding at this juncture. The small blind calls. The double straddler, whose cousins with the keeblers, folds. It's down to heads up. The turn is the king of hearts giving us top pair and a commanding lead. The small blind checks. Broadway cards are always going to be better for our range as the preflop aggressor, whether we actually connect or just pick up a straight draw with a hand like ace queen or queen jack. I continue firing with some of those straight or flush draw combos, so I need to do it when I actually have hands as well. I bet 450 for value. If we're up against two pair better, we'll find out right now because we'll be getting check raised. Instead, the small blind just calls, indicating that our top pair is very likely best. The river is the three of diamonds, it's a total brick. Every single draw misses. The small blind checks. There's still a slight chance that we're losing the king queen of spades or clubs, but star command gives us permission to blast off. I bet 1100. It's a fairly large sizing that might look like a bluff, especially because normally if I'm betting on three streets, I'll have two pair or better a good percentage of the time, or I'll be bluffing. It's hard to have two pair, particularly from my opponent's perspective, when he has removal to two pair combos. The flush and straight draws missing should make it even more enticing for the small blind to call with second pair. Ultimately, he makes the correct fold and avoids losing a substantial amount. We win a medium sized pot, but I'm still stuck several thousand that I'll need to get back before Andy realizes it's gone. Another round of the nick game is on, though we've already won a hand and we've gotten rid of our nick button. Two players limp in for 50 before Gazzy Phil wakes up with a real pair. He raises to 300 from the small blind. Our Jiggities have Gazzy notched. We don't want to call and have multiple players behind us call. I 3-bet to 1,000. I've been ultra-aggressive pre-flop. In fact, this is the second hand in a row that I've 3-bet. Luigi has one of the shortest sacks of the table in the straddle with what's essentially 50 big blinds in front of him. He's tired of my shenanigans. He knows that I can't always have it. He 4-bet rips it with pocket nines, picking a bad time to do it but he was kind of handcuffed with no great options. Folds back to Gazzy, who has an interesting decision with his high pocket pair. Given the table dynamics, Gazzy could justifiably call a raise, thinking that I've been three betting in a high frequency, which could have caused the straddler to four bet with a way worse hand than tens, especially since the straddler still has his nit button. Under the gun, actually cold four bet with a worse hand than Gazzy, but Gazzy knows he also needs to be worried about me having him beat. 
because he only has $300 invested and doesn't need to risk a substantial amount more when he could be crushed. He verbally makes the correct fold. I go for a yellow chip to call, not knowing if we've got the lead, we're flipping, or we're crushed. I'm relieved to see that we're a big favorite. The runouts at the lodge aren't always kind to me. The flop comes queen four deuce rainbow. We keep the lead for the time being. The turn is the seven hearts, bringing us one step closer to winning a pot of almost 5,500. The river is the eight of hearts. It looks a little too close to a nine than I would have preferred, but we win a big all-in pot to get almost all the way out of the hole that we were in. Our stack climbs to about 9,000. It's enough to cause the other opponents a lot of trouble. We double straddle to 50 in this hand. The crow, who has the scariest costume at the table, raises to 125. Wonder Elf makes the light call on the button. We've got pocket tens. Three betting or calling are both reasonable options. I call to close the action. We're going three ways to the flop. It comes jack seven four rainbow. We've got second pair and a backdoor straight draw. I check. The crow puts out a small bet of 125. Wonder Elf doesn't connect well. He folds. After underwrapping our hand pre-flop, I won't be in any hurry to fold, definitely not to a small flop bet, even though it's tricky to play out of position with second pair against a good player when we're unlikely to improve. I call with plans to potentially rep a straight if a 9 or 8 comes on future streets. The turn is the 5 of clubs, 8, 6, and 6, 3 improve to a straight. I check. This will generally be a decent turn for my double straddle defend range, so I don't anticipate too many bluffs from the opponent in this situation. He isn't concerned about us though. He goes with a bigger sizing of 550. I'm surprised to see this bet because I could definitely have straights, sets, and two pair combinations, so this is either a value bet with a strong hand like an over pair or better, or it's a very ambitious bluff. I take the money I saved from not three betting pre-flop, and I call, still having intentions to potentially rep a straight if an opportunity comes. The river is the nine of hearts, putting a third straight possibility on board, which we double block. The crow's chances of winning this at showdown are dead, but he's been known to come back from the dead before. I check. He puts out an enormous overbet at 3,000. It's almost two times the size of the pot. There are multiple things running through my mind right now. First, and maybe most important, is that I really hope Andy doesn't come home early. Next is that 10-8 is the nuts, which we have insane removal for. There's very little chance that our opponent has that, but he bet large on the turn and massive on the river. He could be doing this with an overpair if he puts me on a jack and he's trying to get max value since I've only check called twice, making it seem like I've got a one pair type of hand. The opponent could also be doing this with a set, two pair, or potentially a straight. In the rare instances, he really does have 10-8 or 8-6. Can we credibly rep the highest straight? Well, I definitely play 10-8 the same way, and I'll have every single combo of that in my range, including the offsuit ones. Remember, 10-8 is a double gutter on the turn that gets there on the river, so I still would have called a sizable turn bet. I might have played 8-6 the same way as well because there were no flush draws to be worried about on the turn, so check calling a big bet rather than check raising is still reasonable on that street. I'm not sure if we're ahead or behind, but a check shove will look insanely strong after seeing a $3,000 overbet, especially because a jam is only for about $5,000 more. If the opponent is bluffing, we're beating him anyway so shoving can only help us. If the opponent has anything other than a straight that he's betting for value, his overpairs, two pair combos and sets will be reduced to bluff catchers. This isn't a fun spot for me to be in, but I'm not giving up. Time. Big time over bet. All in. Yeah. He did the street therapy. He was doing Back at you, time. says Brad Owen, Woody Owen. <clears throat> and Woody yeah. Owen loves the nuts snap call. Yeah, nice play there from Woody Owen. Shows double blocking the eight tens of the world. It is the best hand. Did you get a woody when he folded? <laughs> I've been sitting on that all day. There you go. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, Phil and his old jokes. Gazzy Phil. <laughs> Let's go. Ba -dum -ba -dum -ch. Although we had the best hand, it's still hard to find the courage to pull the trigger rather than take the safe way out and fold, which is much easier to justify. I thought shoving instead of calling would be much more likely to win a huge pot for us. It works out, allowing us to win several thousand to be at the top of the leaderboard for the moment. The very next hand, we have a chance to expand upon our profit as T1000 raises to 200 from the small blind. For the first time today, we've got pocket aces. I three bed to 650. The small blind doesn't want to give up just yet. He calls for 450 more. 
We're heads up in position. The flop comes jack three deuce with two hearts. We've got an over pair with backdoor straight and flush possibilities. The opponent checks. We're gonna be betting this a good percentage of the time. I bet 700. The small blind flops top pair, but is in a lot of trouble. He calls. The turn is the queen of diamonds putting another flush draw on the board, and there are a number of hands that are beating us. The opponent checks. In addition to the fact that we could be beat, plenty of the hands that we're ahead of, like eights, nines, and tens, won't like seeing the queen because they get downgraded to third pair and will have a hard time calling another bet. I check back for pot control and to possibly induce bluffs. The river is the ten of spades. It's become a scarier and scarier board, but the good news is that the small blind checks, he likely would have bet with two pair or better, although he could be concerned that I have ace king. It's tough to get value out of any one pair hands on this board. I go with a somewhat small sizing of 1100, so that hands like king queen or king jack can call. The small blind hates it. Uh, I wanted you to bet to get at the house with the So much bigger. The hood. T1000 is implying that it looked more like a bluff if I went with a big sizing, Part of me was worried I'd get snapped off by two pair of pocket tens if I went bigger. T1000 realizes that he only beats bluffs and it's unlikely that I'm bluffing, he folds. We win the pot, it wasn't that long ago that we were stuck a large amount, now we're the biggest winner in the game as we're up over 5,000. Things are just getting started as three players limp in for 50, we're in the straddle with ace five suited, we could check, instead I raised a 400 to punish these guys that have tried to see a cheap flop. Wonder Elf calls for a large portion of his stack. Robin folds. T1000 calls. We're going three ways to the flop with the best hand. The dealer puts out Queen 9 4 Rainbow. We've got one over with backdoor draws, but it's still currently best. Small blind checks. I don't have to bet much to deny equity from worse hands that are live. I bet 300. It's less than one fourth pot. The cutoff folds. Small blind has a gutter and backdoor clubs. He's tired of me pushing people around. It's time for him to make a move. He check raises to 1200. Well, that shuts things down for us. We've got air, but when we stop to think about what the opponent might be check raising us with, it seems a little fishy. If he had queens or nines, he would have raised preflop rather than limp call or raise. He might have even raised preflop with pocket fours. He's mostly just repping queen nine or queen four. That's not that many hands. Even if he had a set or two pair, he may just call the flop bet and wait until the turn to check raise like most humans would. I guess. He's not really one of those though. I suspect that we're up against some type of bluff by either a straight draw or bottom pair with a backdoor flush draw. If I actually had a really strong hand, I wouldn't re-raise right now. I just flat check raises with hands like queens and nines, so I can't credibly make a move at this point. I call the 1200, which should look terrifying to the opponent. In the rare instances that we're up against a real hand that check raises us for value, there are a number of cards that'll help us improve on the next street. But if we happen to see an opening, we can turn our hand into a bluff and take this pot down with next to nothing. The turn is the ten of hearts. King Jack gets there, but that's another hand that probably would have raised preflop, so I can mostly rule out the opponent having the nuts. Small blind pumps the brakes and checks. I suspect that he's worried that we either had a monster on the flop or we turned a monster while he doesn't have much. He would have continued firing with two pair better. We're losing to some of the hands that the opponent might have bluffed with, so we need to try to fold those out. I bet 1700. The opponent snap folds with the best hand after improving the second pair in a gut shot straight draw because our line of betting small on the flop and just flatting the check raise looked so strong that it wasn't worth it for the opponent to put any additional money in the pot. Wow. Works. Honestly, <laughs> incredible play by, by Woody there. We take a creative line that wins us a couple thousand more. Nearly every play we've made has worked out. It's a lot of fun playing when you start stringing moves like this together, and I haven't even made any super strong hands that I'm able to take people to value town with. If sets, straights, or flushes start finding us, we're in a prime situation to get paid off with the image that we currently have. We're playing six-handed at the moment as the elf limps in for 50. Gazzy Phil raises a 200 from the under the gun straddle. We've got jack 10 of spades and double straddle. I call, small blind calls as well. We're going three ways to the flop in position, the dealer puts out 874 all spades. We flop a flush with a straight flush draw. Small blind checks. As he's doing this, Gazzy looks at his cards for a spade outside of the camera's view. Gazzy checks. I know exactly what suits and denomination my cards are, but I check my cards purely for deception and balance so that when I'm genuinely checking to see if I have one card with a particular suit in my hand, good players like Gazzy won't be able to rule out me having flushes. To fully commit to the facade, I sneakily check back the flush. I'm a lot more comfortable checking back the jack high flush in this instance because the nine of spades will give us the absolute nuts and that card might allow us to stack anyone holding the ace of spades. 
If the flop were 843 all spades, I'd be less inclined to check back a vulnerable flush. The turn is another seven pairing the board. Small blind checks. Gazzy is now more confident that his third pair with the straight flush draw is best. He bets 400. If Gazzy was genuinely checking his cards for a spade on the flop, then he won't have two spades for a better flush. He wouldn't have a set or two pair that turn into a full house either because the spade versions for the denomination of cards he'd be holding would be on the flop and Gazzy wouldn't need to check for him. This is an extremely reliable live tell with recreational players, but you still need to be careful with players that have been around for a while because they might switch things up on you like I've been attempting to do throughout the hand. Gazzy is certainly capable of fake checking his cards for a spade, so I can't completely rule out him having ace or king high flushes. I've just significantly discounted it in my mind, partly because there are so many spades that are already accounted for. I call, which I might have done with a variety of pair or one spade combinations. Small blind folds, it's down to heads up. The river is the deuce of diamonds, we've gotten a great run out. The opponent checks, which I don't think you do very often with a better flush. Between the live tells, coupled with how this has been played, I've mostly ruled out all the hands that are beating us. Now I've got the green light to bet, and because of the false live tells I was attempting to give off in my weak looking line so far, I go with a huge overbet of 2000 to make it appear as if I'm attempting a last ditch effort to seal this pot as a bluff with something like king 10 offsuit with one spade. Gazzy has removal to straights and flushes, plus our story doesn't make any sense, especially if we were truly checking our cards on the flop for one spade. My river play doesn't seem consistent with physical tells or how I played the hand earlier. Gazzy has to see. Like, we'll just, oh, oh, like a what a, wow. What a play by Brad, the overbet. There's a lot of houses. Look at one of the small neighborhoods. And um, a lot of the... the Brad's making some plays. There's a lot of nuance to that hand that leads us to getting our big overbet paid off. It's even more interesting because I wouldn't have attempted those tricks if I wasn't up against an opponent who I know is a good thinking player. We get the perfect run out to make the maximum from just a pair of sixes. A couple of players still have their nip buttons as we're playing another round of that game. T1000 doesn't have a nip button, but he raises to 150 from the hijack with the speculative holding anyway. Gazzy's in the cutoff with a reasonable hand and has a nip button. He three bets to 450. We've got a nip button in front of us and we're on the button with pocket nines and no great options. Folding a hand this strong is my least favorite choice. Calling and then allowing someone else to potentially 4-bet isn't great. Even if we cold called the 3-bet and didn't get 4-bet, we'd likely end up playing a multi-way pot, reducing our chances of winning. I know T1000 has been going out of his way to get involved in pots, which opens things up for Gazzy to 3-bet hands he might ordinarily fold. With the nick game going, Gazzy can be 3-betting an ultra-wide range just to try and win a pot. Understanding the situation and the dynamics allows me to 4-bet wider than I normally might. I re, re raise to a thousand, putting extra pressure on the hijack and cutoff. The hijack has an easy decision to let go of his cards. Gazzy might be tempted at least a little to five bet jam, and that would admittedly put me in an uncomfortable spot, but I'll have even better hands a lot of the time that the cutoff would be in bad shape against. The opponent folds. We have to turn over our nines to get rid of our nip button. It's one more play that goes just as we drew it up. With this win, we cross into five-figure profit territory, we've got over 19,000 in front of us, and we're not looking to rack up anytime soon. Five hands later, only a couple players still have the nip buttons, and Robin's one of them. He makes a big raise of 250 from the button, we have a premium hand in the straddle and we're out of position, so I go with a 3-bet to 1,000. It's four times the size of the initial pre-flop raise. Robin wants to get rid of his nip button, he calls for 750 more, it's a substantial portion of his stack, we're heads up. The flop comes queen eight four rainbow. We've got top top and a backdoor flush draw. There's nothing to be concerned about other than maybe being up against a set of eights or fours. I down bet to 500 to keep in a wide range of hands that'll be drawing incredibly slim. There's only one over card that can come out that would downgrade us, so we didn't need to make it much. And this gives the opponent an opportunity to turn a hand like the one that he has into a bluff either right now or on a future street. The button calls, the turn is the king of clubs. It's the worst card in the deck. We get downgraded to second pair and the opponent picks up a flush draw. I check to see how the opponent wants to play this. The opponent could have a king queen or king jack or king 10 suited type of hand that improved to take the lead. He's at least going to rep those types of combos as he bets 2000. It's an uncomfortable situation. I take a look at his stack to see how much he has total. Then I take a look at him to see if I can get any kind of read. If I think ace queen is best, I may as well rip it for 3500 to cover the button because I'm not going to call and then fold on any river for just 1500 more. My first thoughts are that the opponent could have a king, 
then I started thinking that he probably wouldn't have made it so much if he did have a king. It seems like he's trying to get me to fold. The way I've played this hand with a 3-bet preflop, a small bet on the flop, and a check on the turn looks pretty weak, like I've got jacks, tens, or maybe just ace high. My hand is somewhat underrepped. I can't fold every time I've got second pair. The button would have called the small flop bet with a ton of ace x suited hands that might have improved to pick up a flush or straight draw. It feels a lot like we're up against ace jack, ace 10, or jack 10 of clubs, and the opponent is trying to get a semi bluff through. I get a count on my chips just to see if we'd still be winning if we call and end up losing, even though that should never really be a factor in these types of situations. We'll be up 5,000 if we call and lose. If we call and win, we'll be up 15,000. Though I don't really know 100% if we're best, the size of the pot, the strength of our hand, and given how this has been played, all combined, make me comfortable enough to stick around. I go with my read and hope that we're up against a flush draw or worse, as I jam for 3,500 effective. The opponent doesn't snap call, which I kind of thought he might have if he had a strong combo draw or even a hand like ace nine of clubs. The fact that he pauses to think about it makes me happy, then, as he calls the shove, I start getting worried that he could have a weak king. Before seeing his cards, if you listen closely, you hear me express some doubt about my read and why I went with the shove. Oh, Brad faded oh the goodness. snap, Rick, is what we like to call that. We're playing an all-in pot of over $10,000 with second pair as an 80% favorite, and I still don't know what we're up against. We're just gonna run it one time. We have to table our hands. I'm not feeling particularly great as I turn over the pair of queens first. The rest of the table is probably thinking that I've got to be behind, but my read on the situation is about to be confirmed. Yeah. Wow. Well, he didn't have... While I partially expected to see clubs, I wasn't anticipating seeing 9-3 of clubs. I had actually forgotten the nick game was on, and Robin still had a button in front of him. If I had remembered, I might have called even sooner. Making the correct call was only a portion of the battle, though. Now we need to fade a club on the river. The dealer puts out the five of hearts giving us the win. It's another huge pot that comes to us. And there's a feeling at the table right now that no one wants to mess with me. I've been three and four betting pretty relentlessly. I've turned hands into big river bluff shoves and shown. I've made massive over bets for value with hands that aren't close to the nuts and got paid off by worse. And now in this instance, I went with my read, leading me to correctly get it all in on the lighter side, winning a five figure pot to increase the profit to 15,000. It's been an amazing session so far and it still isn't over. Robin rebuys and limps in for 50 to see a cheap flop. We've got pocket jiggities once more in the small blind. We raise the 300. Skull Mike is a newer player in the big blind with a playable hand. He calls. If Robin is calling 1,000 with 9-3 suited, we know he's not gonna be folding much for 250 more. He calls as well. We're going three ways to the flop out of position. Comes King-10-6 with two spades. Our second pair might be best. Checking is reasonable, but I've got invincibility mode turned on. I bet 300 to keep control of the pot for a reasonable price, charge hands that are worse. Mike isn't interested in folding when he's getting four to one pot odds. He calls, drawing incredibly slim, without even any backdoor possibilities, plus another opponent is behind him. Robin has a lot of equity, but he's learned his lesson getting wild with flush draws. He calls, the pot is building up, the turn is the king of clubs. In some ways I like it because it's less likely that we're up against the king, but after getting cold in two spots, I can't comfortably bet for value. I want to make sure that we get to showdown. I check. Mike looks to have the same plan. He checks as well. Robin isn't going to turn his hand into a semi-bluff again. He checks back. Now that neither opponent is bet like they almost certainly would have with trip kings, we can bet river for value if no scare card comes out. The river is the five of diamonds. It's a great card for us. All the draws have missed. I bet 1100 is target a hand containing a 10. It's a tricky situation for Mike with his pair of sixes. He was doing commentary earlier and he saw me making some moves. It wouldn't be a good look for Evil Skull to be too scared to call a bet by a Disney cowboy. Evil Skull doesn't believe that we're strong enough to value bet. He calls. Wow. See, it gets called. Brad is playing above the rim, I gotta say. Robin will lay it down and Woody Owen's gonna show the jiggities. Okay. There's no right way to play the jiggities. Unless you play them the way Brad plays them. Jiggity, jiggity, jiggity. I've had several sessions in the past playing much higher stakes at the same table when almost nothing I did went right. It's nice to finally be on the other side of it when the big decisions are mostly all working out as well as possible and the runouts have been great. No one is eager to mess with me after I've won big pots against nearly every single player at the table. Brand new Nick game has started. Wonder Elf open limps with a surprisingly strong hand in the hijack. Perhaps he's got intentions of limp raising if he gets an opportunity. Instead, he gives multiple people the chance to see a cheap flop. 
T1000 calls, we're in the big blind with queen four suited, it's only 40 more, maybe we can get lucky, make a big hand on the flop, get rid of our nip button. I call, Evil Skull is getting an even better discount than us, he's got a similar idea as he calls for 25 more. This pot isn't about to get reopened, Scotty J win checks his option, we're going five ways to the flop, the dealer puts out king queen eight rainbow, we've got second pair and a backdoor flush draw. He checks to the button, there aren't many strong hands that he can credibly rep in a limp pot with two broadway cards, but that doesn't stop him from pretending that he's got a good enough hand to bet into four other players. He takes a stab for 150. He would have raised preflop with kings, queens, and eights, so there are no set combos that he'll have. He would have raised preflop with king queen as well, so the best hand that he'll have is king eight or queen eight, and we've got removal to queen eight. Someone may have a speed on this flop, I just don't believe it's the button. I call, even if we're behind, we can potentially hit a queen, four, or heart on the turn to improve. I'm surprised to see so much interest in the pot as Evil Skull calls. Scotty J win realizes he's probably no good with so much action. He folds, Wonder Elf has a gutter and an over, he calls one time. Somehow, four of us are still in this. The turn is the nine of hearts giving us a flush draw. Jack 10 makes a straight, which is a hand that we could definitely have, as well as plenty of two pair combinations, including king nine and queen nine. If I check, I'll feel obligated to call a bet. That line doesn't allow us a chance to win right now though, and we'd still have to hit a heart to feel really good about our chances of winning at showdown. I go a different route and lead for 450. This puts a lot of pressure on Evil Skull and Wonder Elf in particular because they have to be concerned that I could have the nuts and they still have the flop better behind them, forcing them to only continue with narrow ranges of hands. Top pair with the six kicker doesn't make the cut, our lead forces Skull Mike to fold the best hand. Even Wonder Elf can't continue with his Broadway draw when he has such a short stack and could be drawing slim as well. He folds. We make it through the players with the most amount of equity. T1000 has to fold with a weak hand like I suspected he had on the flop. Our lead bet gives us the win in a tricky spot to navigate. We successfully get our semi bluff through multiple opponents and have to show what we made our play with to get rid of our nit button. Remember, we're in for 9,000, we're approaching 30,000 in chips. It was a rough beginning, but we didn't get two down. We tried to continue playing our game to the best of our ability, and it's been paying off. This is a match of stack format. The other players all have the funds, but out of respect, no one wants to add on to have even half the amount of chips as us. The VPIP is high as well because our steep position in cards have allowed us to get involved regularly. As this session is winding down, we're in the double straddle when Scotty J win raises to 150 from the cutoff. We're last to act preflop with King Seven Hearts. Since we're closing the action, we can get involved for a discount. I call for 100 more. The flop comes 9-7 deuce with two clubs. We've got middle pair. I check. Scotty J win is the only player that I haven't won a significant hand against the entire session. It's not looking like that'll change given the current circumstances. Aces for Scotty J win. And they start to think, and I'm like, what, what the fuck? <laughs> and Woody Owen, who's made every right move He's today, wasting every Brad, time. It's like, right, right. in trouble here. Euros are the worst. Well, Going to make the call here. Oh my goodness, it is Woody's night. We get a miracle turn to take a huge lead with only one card to come. The problem is that the opponent knows this will be a better card for me. When the second and third highest cards pair on the turn, it's mostly going to be best for the preflop colors range, particularly if they defended their straddle. If I check, the opponent is going to frequently check back. I don't want him to see a free card. I lead for 250. The graphics were slightly off on the flop. The opponent actually bet 300 instead of 200, so the pot is currently 950 instead of 750. Scotty J win has to be contemplating a raise with his overpair. He's too crafty for that though. He calls the small bet. It's tough to know exactly what he has since he'll have a wide range consisting of full houses, overpairs, draws, a pair of nines, and maybe even smaller pocket pairs like eights or sixes that don't want to give up when they're getting five to one pot odds. The river is the king of diamonds giving us a full house. This is the only really strong hand that we've had all day in a big pot other than when we flopped a flush with jack ten of spades, but even in that hand, we didn't have anything all that close to the nuts once the board paired on the turn. The king is a card that'll generally be better for the opponent, so I check to act as if we've got just a nine or worse and we're scared of the overcard. This allows the cutoff a chance to bluff with missed draws and even bet for value with king x of clubs or ace king if he happens to have either of those types of holdings. The cutoff takes the bait, betting 750 more. Now we have an opportunity to make a lot more money. The question is, how much would the opponent call with a pair of kings? 
We don't have to worry about getting calls from worse hands than that because almost everything worse than top pair would have checked back the river or won't be able to call a check raise anyway. I go with a big check raise to 3,000. Again, the line is surprising. We check called a large bet on the flop, lead turn for an even smaller amount as if we wanted to see a river cheaply, and now we've put in a huge check raise. Scotty J win saw me lead turn in the queen forehands as a semi bluff. He saw me check jam river for 8,000 with second pair on a coordinated jack high board and we had pocket tens. All the moves that I've been making along the way with weaker hands should have helped craft an image that'll make it easier to get paid in this spot, especially by aces because I might even play king nine of hearts the same way. The opponent's hand is under repped and he can beat some hands that I might play this way for value, but he's a sly slide dog. He makes a great lay down to avoid losing a couple thousand more. We still win another large pot to get our stack up to $28,000. It's been an awesome night. This is listed as a 510 game. It always plays much bigger, but we end up being by far the biggest winner on the stream. After losing about $300,000 over the course of only three sessions playing nosebleed stakes in February at the Lodge, I've had several big wins in much smaller games on stream to get about $100,000 back. I still have more to accomplish, but I'm playing with a lot of confidence right now. Got a big win here tonight. I won $19,000 and just everything that I did kind of worked out for the most part. There's always things to improve upon, but uh, the big moves got through and when I had hands, they mostly, I, I, I was able to get close to the max out of a lot of them. So um, that was probably the best poker session that I've ever played. I've had some really rough ones here, including a ton of massive losses in the biggest games I've ever played but uh, to to play like that and, and have it all go well um, with a lot of good players in the game was awesome and it just just helps to you know increase the confidence and um, I, I just I just feel really good about it overall so uh, get enjoy the win my buddy is having a Halloween party tonight who I went to high school with so I'm excited to hang out with him and um, just relax this is the biggest game that I'll be playing on the trip and it's gone well and uh, yeah man I'm, I'm just really happy. Though I currently live in Las Vegas most of the time, Austin definitely feels like home. Not only are there a ton of great people who I've met through poker out here, but one of my best friends from high school lives in town as well. It's always nice to hang out with him and his girlfriend who are throwing the party, especially right after a big win. The night gets started with some pretty impressive beer pong action as players are going shot for shot while I'm happy to sit on the couch and decompress. The night doesn't end here though. The dealers at the lodge invite me to their after party, which I get to around 1am. These guys don't sleep. It's awesome to spend some time with everyone away from the tables, although the beer pong here is a little less impressive. The night wraps up with a lot of us hanging out on the porch relaxing as we watch scary movies projected onto the back of the house. It's a memorable night and one of my favorite overall days that I've had in Austin. That's it for this one guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons. It helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comments section. I'm happy to get back to you. Uh, don't forget to use that bonus code BRAD when you sign up to WPT Global to get the deposit match bonus up to $1,200, the satellite tickets to the WPT World Championship this December at Win Las Vegas, and if you deposit $100 or more, you receive an extra 50 in cash. So I have more information in the description box below, but uh, yeah, be sure to take advantage of that. They have the softest online games and uh, tons, of, tons of really good tournaments on there as well. Um, this episode was actually a little bit out of order. Uh, if, if I was going to put this episode out in the correct order, it would come out in December and it's a Halloween themed episode. So kind of move things around. Um, but there's another poker vlog coming from the lodge from the same trip that will be in order. Uh, so, you know, be on the lookout for that in a couple of weeks. I just have a ton of videos kind of in the pipeline that I'm excited to share with you guys. 
And then we've got some meetup games coming up. Andrew and I are hosting a meetup game November 9th at Best Bet in Jacksonville. And we are hosting our premier mug December 1st at WPT to kick off the World Championship. So those are going to be awesome events. More information in the description box below. Hope you guys are all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables, and I'll see you next time.